That's Atika, what let me let me interrupt you for just a moment. We've got uh, uh, Prime Minister Cameron now speaking. Let's listen. In the name of Islam, that is nonsense. Islam is a religion of peace. They are not Muslims. They are monsters. They make no secret of their desire to do as much harm, not just in the Middle East, but to any countries or peoples who seek to stand in their way or dare to stand for values that they disagree with. It was an ISIL fanatic who gunned down four people in a museum in Brussels. So let me be clear. The British people need to know that this is a fanatical organisation called ISIL that has not only murdered a British hostage, they have planned and continue to plan attacks across Europe and in our country. We are a peaceful people. We do not seek out confrontation, but we need to understand we cannot ignore this threat to our security and that of our allies. There is no option of keeping our heads down that would make us safe. The problem would merely get worse, as it has done over recent months, not just for us, but for Europe and for the world. We cannot just walk on by if we are to keep this country safe. We have to confront this menace. Step by step, we must drive back dismantle and ultimately destroy ISIL and what it stands for. We will do so in a calm, deliberate way, but with an iron determination. We will not do so on our own, but by working closely with our allies, not just the United States and in Europe, but also in the region. Because this organization poses a massive threat to the entire Middle East. So we will defeat ISIL through a comprehensive and sustained counter-terrorism strategy. First, we will work with the Iraqi government to ensure it represents all of its people and is able to tackle this threat effectively. We will support the Kurdish regional government who are holding the front line against ISIL. We will help them protect their own people and the minorities, including Christians, that they've helped already through our supplies of ammunition and through training. Second, we will work at the United Nations to mobilize the broadest possible support to bear down on ISIL. Third, the United States is taking direct military action. We support that. British tornadoes and surveillance aircraft have been helping with intelligence gathering and logistics. This is not about British combat troops on the ground. It is about working with others to extinguish this terrorist threat. As this strategy intensifies, we are ready to take whatever steps are necessary to deal with this threat and keep our country safe. Fourth, we will continue to support the enormous humanitarian efforts, including using the RAF to do so, to help the literally millions of people who have fled ISIL and are now living in appalling conditions. And fifth, and perhaps most important, we will maintain and continually reinforce our formidable counter-terrorist effort here at home to prevent attacks and to hunt down those who are planning them. People across this country will have been sickened by the fact that it could have been a British citizen, a British citizen who could have carried out this unspeakable act. It is the very opposite of everything our country stands for. It falls to the government and to each and every one of us to drain this poison from our society and to take on this warped ideology that is radicalizing some of our young people. The murder of David Haynes at the hands of ISIL will not lead Britain to shirk our responsibility with our allies to deal with the threat that this organization poses. It must strengthen our resolve. We must recognize that it will take time to eradicate a threat like this. It will require, as I've described, action at home and abroad. This is not something we can do on our own. We have to work with the rest of the world. But ultimately, our security as a nation, the way we go about our everyday lives in this free and tolerant society that is Britain, has always depended on our readiness to act against those who stand for hatred and who stand for destruction. And that is exactly what we will do. Thank you. All right, comments there from uh, British Prime Minister David Cameron uh, speaking after, of course, the release of this recording 
of the, uh, the execution, the beheading of David Haynes. Uh, do we still have uh, Atika Schubert with us in London? Atika, okay. I want to come right out to you. Uh, the Prime Minister there detailing several things, several ways that uh, the UK will work with the international community, the UN, the US, uh, and other, other countries to be able to attack uh, ISIS. Um, this is in line, uh, actually strengthening what he said over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, in fact, he very clearly said that Britain will not shirk responsibilities. It will, this video will only strengthen our resolve. Now, the thing that a lot of the British pu public will be looking at is what kind of military support Britain will be lending to this coalition against ISIS. He already said that British jets, for example, have been involved with intelligence gathering, supporting the coalition in that way. But he also very clearly said this is not about boots on the ground. And the open question that still remains is is whether or not Britain will actually help with airstrikes in Syria. This is something that last year British lawmakers clearly voted against. Now that means at the moment the British Prime Minister may not be able to carry out airstrikes in Syria, but they haven't ruled it out. So it's always a possibility. And it does sound like by the tone of this um, statement that Britain is now quite seriously considering it to strengthen their military resolve. All right, I just want to reintroduce our panel here, Atika Schubert, Anna Corrin, Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis, and Aaron McPike all with us as we just heard from Prime Minister uh, David Cameron there. He did say something uh, to that point that I, I thought stuck with me, and, and uh, Lieutenant Colonel McGinnis, I want to get your uh, thoughts on this. He said, this isn't about British, trips, British troops on the ground. He did not say, we are not sending British troops on the ground, but he said this isn't about them. What do you take of that particular uh, verbiage? Well, you know, Christy, the, the prime minister fully understands that we are not going to defeat ISIS from the air alone. Uh, and, of course, President Obama's made it clear that we need to you know, get the Iraqis, the Peshmerga to do more, but, of course, Syrian moderates. And, of course, and then we're struggling right now, as Secretary Kerry is all over the Middle East, in Riyadh, in Ankara, in Cairo, trying to recruit those boots on the ground that are going to do this particular job. But at the end of the day, if we don't have reliable ground forces to augment the air effort, you know, it's going to be a long slog trying to resolve this conflict. And of course, you know, just the other day, you know, the White House made it very clear, we are at war with ISIS. And at war, you have to bring all the elements of power to bear, not just diplomatic. Uh, we've got to have military people on the ground to do this. And you know, it's not looking good at this point, but I think Mr. Cameron's statement suggests that there will be people there. You know, e even the prime minister of Australia said this morning he's going to send advisors. Well, advisors become combatants ultimately if the time continues and the circumstances dictate. So if, if we're hearing from uh, Prime Minister Abbott and we're hearing from Prime Minister Cameron, not the direct refusal to send uh, their troops, but we're hearing from President Obama that he's not sending U.S. troops. Is the president being honest with us? Is he being straightforward with us? I, I, I want to read for you something that I read uh, uh, this morning in the Times in which it describes the Syrian, uh, the, the moderate forces, the Free Syrian Army uh, especially. It says that they've been weak, divided, without coherent plans. Today, they're even weaker, more divided. In some cases, their best fighters are hardline Islamists. So if we know that about the, the, the uh, moderate forces, why are we hearing from the leaders that they likely will not, or in some cases absolutely will not, send in their troops? It seems like they would have to. Yeah, it's a difficult situation, Victor. Look at what's going on in Aleppo, Syria, where you know Free Syrian Army is actually co collaborating with some of these radical groups. And so f vetting out a moderate force that we can arm and then depend and that Riyadh said they can come in and train is going to be incredibly difficult. What we will probably see over time are special operating forces uh, in small groups that will be operating eventually in Syria. They have to. You know, Raqqa is the epicenter of where all this fighting is coming from. And if we don't have people on the ground in Raqqa going after ISIS, I don't know how in the world we're going to sort out and defend the, the, the innocents that are there clearly, and then at the same time destroy the infrastructure of ISIS. 
All right. Uh, we're going to hold our panel here. If you'll all just uh, stay close, we're going to take a quick break and continue the conversation on the other side. Stay close.